Hello, and welcome back to The Coin Story Show, where we get to hear from the leading voices in Bitcoin, financial markets, macro, and even beyond. This podcast does not provide financial advice. It is for educational purposes only. These episodes and interviews wouldn't be possible without my partners. So first up, OKCoin. OKCoin is one of the fastest growing and most secure global cryptocurrency exchanges where you can buy and learn about Bitcoin. OKCoin is committed to investing in educational content, funding Bitcoin and Lightning Network developers, as well as supporting crypto entrepreneurs from underrepresented groups so that we have a more diverse pool of talent that works on Bitcoin ecosystem projects and careers. OKCoin has contributed more than $1 million to core devs and counting and has one of the most active lightning nodes. I also love that you can toggle between Bitcoin and Sats mode. And if you want to get started investing, head to okcoin.com slash Natalie and get $50 in Bitcoin when you sign up. Parker, thank you so much for joining me. I've been wanting to chat with you for a while. And thanks for welcoming me to your office. Absolutely. Technically, this is uh, the TFTC studio, but uh, it's within the Bitcoin <laughs> Commons, which we help put together. So it's good to have you back in Austin. Yeah, I'm exploring living here. And so, I mean, you know, I start all the way at the beginning. You're from here, right? I'm born and raised in Austin. Yeah. And uh, it's been fun to help see, you know, help see the, the Bitcoin community grow here as much as it has. So, yeah. It's I, huge. Uh, I'm an a active advocate. And uh, as I was recruiting you a few nights ago, I... I'm a great economic <laughs> development source for the city of Austin. Yeah, well, your um, employees said that you're going to be the mayor of Austin. So I got to move before that happens. We got to yeah, elect you. I think uh, amongst this community, I'm the self-proclaimed mayor. Oh, okay. Uh, and at some point, maybe down the line, if, if the Bitcoin community needs it, then I'll, I'll run for actual <laughs> mayor and, and I'll win and make sure that this is a Bitcoin citadel. Everybody's clapping for you already. I know. So. They do that when I ask. You know, it's like the Jeb Bush thing. Like, Please clap. <laughs> Please laugh. Yeah, I don't know if you, that that uh, applause was picked up, but okay. So, what was your life like in Austin? What What did you well, want to do? Well, should we explain what's going on out there? Yeah, first? why don't you explain it? Because it was a big crowd out there. Yeah. So uh, right now, uh, the, earlier this week was the uh, Bitcoin Plus Plus conference that Base Fifty Eight, Lisa Nigat, um, uh, who runs Base Fifty Eight, uh, and Sean help run. And so, the last two days, or I guess Tuesday, Wednesday was a Bitcoin developer conference. And then the last two days has been a hackathon here at the Bitcoin Commons. And so there's about 13 teams. And right now they're presenting their projects that they've been hacking on over the last 24 to 36 hours. And the winners will be crowned uh, in about an hour from now. What is a hackathon? So, uh, okay, look, I'm, I'm not a developer, but uh, I've now, this is probably my third hackathon of, uh, of having attended. And so groups come together. Um, there's generally a few workshops um, talking about um, a few technical elements that someone might want to develop on top of. And people come and then they split up into groups. They're generally not, uh, there's generally a rule that you can't coordinate ahead of time of what you're going to develop. Um, but, but groups form organically based on the projects that they want to work on. They then literally hack up a project, uh, like a, a software project, and then present them kind of within the same 24, 30 hour period. Um, so I saw a few of the, um, the projects that were being worked on here. I think that there's a, uh, integration between Zaprite and, and the Galloy, the, the Bitcoin Beach Wallet. Uh, Zaprite's an invoicing service, but um, somebody was working on a way to take mining rewards directly into Lightning Network. So people just work on what they want to work on, and then they present it, and then they're judged on polish how. Um, so there's multiple different rewards, like best overall project, polish how ambition, ambitious a project was, such, such that somebody might try a project and it might fail, but it might have been a really big, ambitious uh, kind of bite off the apple. So, um, so yeah, so right now groups are going through and presenting, uh, the projects that they built, uh, to everybody else. So there's about a hundred people in the Bitcoin commons right now, uh, talking about all the infrastructure that, uh, the developers can think up. That is so cool. Yeah. It was a full house and I'm glad you explained it. Cause when I heard hackathon, I'm like, are these people trying to like break the security walls, see who can hack like a website first as a competition, but yeah, they're not, they're not hacking, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the, the building next door. I actually, this is the first time I went, I had that question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was cool. Um, S uh, S Senator Lummis came by yeah. uh, earlier today. I cool. uh, got to explain what a hackathon was to her oh, and good. see so many people here working. So uh, she's obviously a great advocate. Mm -hmm. So to get her to come in and be able to see people actively working on building and innovating, um, yeah. that's what it's about. Yeah. Okay. Well, back to you, Parker. Okay, okay. You grew up in Austin. 
what did you want to be when you grew up? Were you into computer science and programming or finance? Like, what did you want to do? I wanted to be a firefighter. You did? No, God, I, uh, that was just the first thing that popped into my head. Oh, now, okay. I, I was like, be, was your dad a firefighter? No, <laughs> um, no, I, uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't think I had something where it was like, I'm going to be an astronaut, or I'm going to be a firefighter, or I'm going to be X, Y, or Z. All right. Grew up a big sports fan. Um, went to college at Duke. Ended up going into investment banking. Dis disliked that genuinely, um, but ultimately worked more in the traditional financial world um, up until the point where I was at a hedge fund in Dallas, mm -hmm. and that's where I went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. But why did you want to study economics in college? You studied economics at Duke, right? Yes. Um, I honestly wasn't done with a lot of intention other than I, I don't think I wanted to be a doctor. Okay. Yeah. What did your parents do? Uh, my dad's a real estate developer. My okay. mom uh, is a mom and a, an attorney. Okay. Yeah, so my mom went back to uh, law school when I was in elementary school. So okay. she's no longer practicing, but mm -hmm. practiced for a bit. Did you have an idea when you were young, like, I want to achieve a certain amount of wealth. I want to be rich. I like think about money. I save. I invest. Um, I, I mean, I, I would say, I mean, I don't ever think I had the ambition to be like, uber wealthy. Mm -hmm. It's like, I want to have enough wealth to not have to worry about wealth. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but I do remember, so I was, um, I came out of college and was on wall street for the financial crisis. And I just remember the chaos of the financial crisis, of like people in boardrooms, like talking about Lehman brothers and whether Deutsche bank, I was at Deutsche bank, like there was parts of the M&A group, like looking at some of those crazy deals. Yeah. And I just would see, you know, people that I genuinely liked being like up at the office at 11 p.m. And, you know, kids in Greenwich. And you're like, I was like, I never want to be I never want to be in that position where I could be tapped on the shoulder one day and told I don't have a job anymore. Mm. Uh, and that's what happened during the financial crisis. Mm. So I would say that that was more formative at a, at a young age in my career. Than, than like in high school wanting to, you know, be uber wealthy. Did that predispose you to just kind of question the financial system and, and even maybe make you question your education? Because I'm assuming you learned a lot of Keynesian economic theory, right? Yeah, I think I definitely was well schooled in the, the <laughs> Keynesian classical, however you want to describe it. Yeah. And, and I do think that, that that ultimately served a function in giving me a frame of reference to to challenge assumptions to say, hey, if I'm looking at this thing, Bitcoin and this Austrian view of the mm -hmm. world, I was probably perfectly predisposed to reject that. But that mm -hmm. once having combination of the experience of the financial crisis, but then um, kind of what I did in the interim, you know, from from that time to up in the point where I went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, mm -hmm. that when I really relied on experience and common sense versus what you were educated when you were 18 years old, um, Austrian economics just made a whole lot more sense in practice. Um, but I, I think that the way that I think about the financial crisis was it was just clear that something was horribly wrong. But at the time, recently out of college, you don't really worry about mm -hmm. like what the consequences are. Yeah. But I, but that always stayed in my mind of never put yourself in the position where you need a job mm -hmm. and something was horribly wrong and, don't really know what it what it was yeah and it wasn't until 10 years later that i went back down the the fed and and mm -hmm. financial crisis rabbit hole and i figured out exactly what was happening around right. me at the time and that's what led me to bitcoin okay i want to get to that um first of all was your family affected at all by the financial crisis and what roles did you have when you were entering into that portion of your career in traditional finance um i don't think my i mean everyone was affected by it but not like in a yeah. losing jobs and you know um but but more so just from the perspective of a lot of people did yeah you know and just thinking about and and people that i worked with and people that couldn't afford yeah. to lose jobs um but it wasn't just wall street it was everywhere mm -hmm. you know um and then very similar things happened in march of 2020 you know yep. like, and putting yourself in a position where like, whatever happens i'm not dependent on anybody for anything um i think that's a really important principle but um, so I think, you know, kind of what I was doing immediately. So when I worked in investment banking, I worked in restructuring. Basically, after the financial crisis, a lot of credit needed to be restructured. Mm -hmm. um, and then 
that and wound me up at a hedge fund. So yeah. I was working at a hedge fund. Um, I was actually involved uh, in a, a you know, stumbled upon a company that was operating fraudulently. We ended up having an activist short position. Wow. Um, the company ended up getting raided by the FBI. Um, that must have paid off for you guys. Um, yeah, in certain ways, the, the, the company ended up suing the fund that I was at after oh, I wow. left. But uh, the people actually um, ultimately got uh, indicted by the Department of Justice. Oh, my gosh. Just a few months ago got convicted. So, you know, uh, ju justice was served. Whoa. Um, but it was actually after the FBI had raided this corporate headquarters that I was asked to go do diligence on a gold company. Oh. Um, yeah. And that was, I was basically doing a, a path of research for the fund that was what will happen when the Fed starts to unwind post-financial crisis QE, hmm. the money that they had put yep. in, uh, in 2009 to 2014 after <laughs> the financial crisis. Oh, they thought crisis. it would stop. <laughs> yeah. And that's when I, I really figured out that it could never stop. Yeah. Oh, that, really? You figured it out? Yeah. How? Well, as I kept kind of going deeper and deeper down that rabbit hole, I was trying to understand how much debt there was in the system and how many dollars there actually were. And, and I was having to understand kind of through the Fed zone reporting, like, w like when it was debt, what, what they would actually describe as debt. Was this like the synthetics, CDO, CDS, or was it really mortgages? Or was it really student debt? Was it really credit card debt? Was it really state, federal, local debt? And what I figured out, and this was where I came to the conclusion that it will happen inevitable ad infinitum in perpetuity, however you want to think about it, was that at the time of the financial crisis, 2007, end of 2007, crisis didn't really happen until right. 2008. Yeah. Um, September, Bear Stearns failed in March of 2008, um, or I guess didn't fail, but was, right. I think, a, um, taken over. And then Lehman Brothers was let to fail um, in September of 2008. Then I figured out that at the end of 2007, there was $52 trillion of dollar-denominated debt in the United States system. And there were only three hundred and fifty billion dollars in the banking system, um, and wow. what that meant that was every dollar that existed had been lent out over one hundred and fifty times, and oh my that gosh. Um, that must have been a shocking moment for you. Yeah. Well, my first reaction was like, could this be true? And so then I was like, like, is this number that I'm looking at for the dollars that the Fed is reporting that the banks hold is that is that the actual right number I should be looking at? So I was like, understanding definitions of like you know, making sure like this can't be right. And the more that I looked, I was like, this is right. Um, but it was that that um, created the run on the banking system. If your system is levered 150 to one, right. again, ignoring unfunded pension liabilities, ignoring uh, synthetic derivatives, this is just vanilla debt, that when everyone figures <laughs> out that the debt, music, that. music stops, it's not just like, you know, because people talk about the game of musical chairs sure. where you know, there's six people walking around a circle. There's only five chairs. One person's left out. Well, this was like 149 out of yeah. 150 were left out. So um, that was what required that they need to put in trillions of dollars because it essentially deleveraged the financial system. Right. That continues to be true to this day. Well, what the hell? I mean, if it was 151 then, what is it now? Well, because they printed so much money, it's only about maybe i haven't looked at this recently but it's probably only 10 to 1 really because they've printed they've increased the money supply by 10 times and that just collapses because the purchasing power of all of our money yeah. correct and but that but but through that period so 2007 52 trillion of debt the only way that quantitative easing works is it, it is designed to cause credit expansion mm -hmm. So it's like they put new dollars in so the existing amount of debt can be sustained mm -hmm. and such that the existing debt levels can grow mm -hmm. because essentially what was happening was the debt was collapsing on itself. Mm -hmm. Knock on defaults. They put in money that caused the credit system to metastasize. So like yeah. 2007, 52 trillion of debt currently like 88 trillion. Mm -hmm. Like in the last 14 years, $36 trillion of yep. dollar denominated debt had been created. And that wouldn't be possible if they didn't keep putting money in the system. So then the same thing happened in 2020 credit system starts to collapse because it's the, you know, big tree fall hard. And, and now the credit system is actually larger in nominal terms 
So they actually need more money to be able to delever it in such a way that it stops collapsing. Right. Um, they basically have to flood the system with dollars. Jeez. And and that same thing that existed in 2008 yeah. happened in 2020. Uh, technically speaking, it started in 2019, mm -hmm. September. People associate it with the financial or with the COVID thing, but it was already done. Like they had already they had already printed right. 500 billion dollars before the COVID lockdown, and uh, and the same thing is true today. Like today, yeah. they're going to have to print trillions more dollars um, because they're going to walk into another buzzsaw. The Fed right. is like in the process of it. Right. Well, let's talk about that in a little bit, but you're totally touching on even what, you know, Jeff Booth puts out in his book of just that money printing has to accelerate now because it all just goes faster and faster and faster. It's gradually and then suddenly, right? Like your your series. Um, but so when you were, I guess, researching gold, did that turn you into a gold bug a little bit or how did you eventually find Bitcoin? Yeah. So kind of connecting that other story. So the FBI raided the corporate headquarters of this uh, this company that was operating fraudulently and the stock became halted for w weeks, ultimately like eight months. And I had been working on this project for a long time, basically doing the research to uncover um, what we believed was a fraud, which now that these people have been convicted. Um, Can you say the company? It's called UDF. The, or okay. the ticker was called, it was UDF. Uh, okay. It's no longer registered. They've had their registration revoked. Yeah. Um, but I had some time in my hands and I was asked to go do diligence on this gold company. It was actually called Bitgold. Um, and the founder, who's somebody that I've got a lot of respect for, he helped me understand money. Um, I don't think he fully understands Bitcoin yet, but his name is Roy Sabog. Okay. Um, it was called Bitgold and it talked about blockchain. I didn't know about Bit. I knew about, I knew of Bitcoin. I hadn't gone down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Oh, okay. So I reach out to my friend, Will Cole, mm -hmm. um, and ask him, does this have anything to do with Bitcoin? And he says, no. He like looked at the website. Hey, it doesn't have anything to do with Bitcoin, but I've got a gold guy. And that ended up being Safe Dean Moose. So I got connected with Safe, um, kind of oh. over emails. When when was this? Uh, 2016. Wow. Yeah. And you and Will are like friends from back home or? Yeah, I went to preschool together. Oh, since preschool. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Some people might know him who listen to this. So yeah, that's great. Um, yeah. Right. Did he help you discover Bitcoin first when, before you went down the rabbit hole, just like you guys heard about it or. Yeah. I mean, well, so he told me like he connected me with safe. Okay. And he like told me like, Hey, you need to look into Bitcoin. Oh, okay. You know? Okay. And so like, but you I had was, heard I was, about it. I thought from yeah. him, oh, okay. I just hadn't been like, yeah, I was didn't like, go down I, was the like hole. I always think about it as I was, wow. I was highly skeptical of Bitcoin. I was never dismissive. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. Um, and I don't think this book had come out yet. Like the Bitcoin standard wasn't out in no, 2016 that, yet. Yeah, that's part of the story. Um, but so Safe um, kind of had a dialogue with him over email. And I was going up to Toronto to do diligence on this company, Bitgold. And Safe happened to be in Windsor. Um, I believe have maybe his, uh, are about to, be expecting his first child oh. and that was like two hours away from toronto and so he suggested hey why don't i come up to these meetings with you so never met the person but i was like yeah come on let's do this um so safe really was formative in me helping that he helped me understand money like what is money and why gold had emerged as money mm -hmm. and that was that was critical uh to me then quickly understanding bitcoin as money so he had become he had started to become interested in Bitcoin. Um, so it was called Bitgold, but it had nothing to do with Bitcoin. Correct. Because it was, yeah. it was like, yeah. you know, blockchain wow, uh, kind of ordering of transactions. I don't know. But, Got it. Yeah. And so but anyways, it, but the fact that it was called yeah. that was what made me reach out to Will. That's he then crazy. connected me to Safe, um, formed a friendship with Safe. He helped me understand why, wow. um, you know, kind of the, the idea of like what made something money better or worse form of money. And then through conversations with Will, one of my other friends, uh, Brooks Dudley kept telling me I needed to bit buy Bitcoin too. I didn't, I didn't really understand it, but he was always in my ear, but it was like, Will and I, uh, would go skiing in, in Wyoming, mm -hmm. uh, where his wife's family, uh, is from. And we would just listen to Bitcoin podcasts for, you know, up and back from the slopes. And then yeah. that, the combination of that and conversations with safe kind of helped turn light bulbs on. And so 
it really started to click in uh, late 2016. Mm-hmm. And so like, it was like something clicked. I was like, Oh, this Bitcoin thing is not nothing. It might yeah. be money. Um, and, wow. and then a few months after that safe sent me an early version of the Bitcoin standard. Oh, cool. Yeah. So you started to allocate a little bit. And meanwhile, you were working at, it was at Heyman capital you were working at. Yeah. Okay. So how did you, I guess, segue, I mean, how did you come to unchained capital? Um, well, so through that period, I remember um, I still have a copy of Safe's manuscript. That's awesome. And I was flying down to Nicaragua, and I was like, I just remember, like, you know, like it had it had already started to make sense, but that like was like light bulbs going off. Oh, it, like that book changed my fu- life. Fully, I'm fully here because of that book. <laughs> connected, connected dots, um, and so that would have been like May or so of 2017, or okay. maybe. April or something around there. Um, but to, as soon as that, like, it was like, started to make sense. Then like every dot being connected, I came to the conclusion and I, I was anchored to this idea that independent of Bitcoin, the federal reserve was going to have to print trillions of dollars mm-hmm. and it wasn't just going to create marginal inflation. Like it will end the way that Venezuela ends print money. People can't, go produce things like oil and gas and power and cars for things that are free to create out of thin air Mm -hmm. that like even if humans do not understand it functionally they understand it from a common sense Mm -hmm. self-preservation and that's why confidence is breaking in fiat currencies all over the world um so like i was anchored to this idea that the fed was gonna have to print trillions of dollars and that the dollar was going away Um, and so it was like, there has to be a solution. And then I started to figure out Bitcoin's the solution. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin, because like I was pursuing two paths of research, Bitcoin and what is going to happen when the Fed unwinds and they can't, and they're going to have to print trillions of dollars. This thing, Bitcoin is the solution to this thing, the Fed and our dollars being printed or money. Um, when I came to that conclusion, I was like, Bitcoin will be a global, will be the global reserve currency. And I quit my job, not with something immediately to do. Wow. I was like, I'm going to go work on Bitcoin. That's great. Um, went deeper down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, like read more of the technical stuff to understand how the network actually works. Yeah. Like the glue. Um, I view the Bitcoin standard as the why, um, mm-hmm. why Bitcoin exists, why it's, you know, what what is money and why yeah. Bitcoin is it. And then on uh, the technical side, I read Mastering Bitcoin. So I spent probably about a year just going deep down the technical side to understand, like, does this whole thing actually work? How does it work? And that deepened my understanding, conviction. And I I really was viewing if Bitcoin's money, then, uh, then the most important thing is custody. Mm. Uh, and and that doesn't mean working with a third party custodian, but it means mm-hmm. if if a, if money is to store value, mm-hmm. then you have to know that that money is going to be there. Something that you could possibly lose cannot be a store of value. And so um, I started thinking about like what I would want to do working on Bitcoin, but I was always anchored to that that logic. Mm. Maybe at the time, one percent of people had Bitcoin. That was probably generous in terms of any material amount of money but 100% of people were going to have money mm-hmm. in Bitcoin. Um, every company in the world, every individual in the world, they're, they're going to have to have Bitcoin because like, money is like water. Human beings need it to survive. Yep. And if Bitcoin's money, then people are going to need to custody it more securely. Mm-hmm. And so um, I was working on a few kind of ideas of my own, ended up uh, moving back to Austin, kind of came back, saw a number of people already here working on Bitcoin. Oh, um, kind of had, had, I had a vision at that time that Bitcoin was, that Austin was going to be the Bitcoin capital of the world. I saw it. Um, and like not in a like dream sense. And like I, I, had, I went to a dinner, uh, maybe with Bitstein and a few other people. And there were like, there was like 12 people and five of them had no roots in Austin were working on Bitcoin in some way or another. And they had just moved to Austin in the last like month. And I was like, okay, wow. this is not just a, yeah. It's not by coincidence. No, everybody's yeah. moving here for 
Bitcoin. So <laughs> I, I knew I wanted to be back in Austin. I was, I was in Dallas at the time. And so decided to, uh, I wanted to work on Bitcoin and that Austin would be the best place to do it. As many more people have now figured that, that thing out that I figured out then, uh, I would have been back here anyways, cause this is home. Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah. And then, and then, you know, through that process, I met, uh, Joe and Drew, the two co-founders at Unchain. Uh, Unchain was a, a Bitcoin back lender at the time. Um, the thing that Joe and Drew, Drew recognized was that if they were going to lend against Bitcoin, then the most important part of that value chain to either someone borrowing against their Bitcoin or someone providing lending capital was how the Bitcoin was secured. And mm-hmm. I had suggested that uh, they carve the custody piece out and offer that as a standalone. Just I wasn't looking for a job. But just kind of talking strategy yeah. of what I would do, and uh, well, that's great. Um, yeah, I s- suggested a few ideas, and then one day they were like, "Hey, why don't you, you know we like that idea? Why don't you come help us build that?" So, wow! And the rest is history. When was that? 2017, 2018. 2018. That's awesome. That's awesome. You like created your own destiny. Okay, I want to talk to you a little bit more about custody and lending. But first, um, when you talk about how Bitcoin is the solution for you know the Fed printing all this money, just out of curiosity, like. Is it is it a solution in the sense of just individuals adopting it, or or is it also a solution in the U.S. government should put Bitcoin on the balance sheet, or like, is it is it somehow going to help the debt spiral that we're in if we have this hard asset at the base layer if they purchase it? Okay, that's a um, that's a big question. So I think about this in a few different ways. Okay, everybody needs money including governments and Bitcoin is the best form of money that's ever existed. Mm -hmm. And our current form of money is is dying and it's going to, it's going to take a lot of people with it, whether in like physical death, but like people are, it's, it's going to wealth will be destroyed when people really, I mean, it already was like, it's kind of like the bodies are already buried and everyone's about to find out. Um, Bitcoin's a lifeboat. There is no way to transition from a world of excess and one uh, riddled and drowning in debt to one not. Uh, You can't just take a patient Mm -hmm. off of heroin and not have that patient go through withdrawal. So so my view is that everyone is going to have to have Bitcoin. Uh, And for that idea that like when I say like Bitcoin is, is like, it is as basic of a necessity as water is. Humans need water to survive humans need money to survive. Mm-hmm. Like, and the, and the exercise that I tell people is like, go to a grocery store and think about how many people had to conspire to get all of those things in one place. There, there is no way that a million people can populate or live in peace in Austin without the grocery store being full. The only way that the grocery store is full is if money is coordinating economic activity reliably mm-hmm. to get those goods to market clean water to your house, get power to your house. Yeah. That, that money is a necessary function of that. That is what breaks down when money dies. That's what's happened in Venezuela. That's what's happening in Turkey. It is what will happen. And I view Bitcoin as it is not just a backup system. It is the system that is going to ensure that the patient doesn't die, Mm -hmm. but that certain people are going to feel more pain than others. And that people that have, Bitcoin that ha- that have a lifeboat are going to feel it less, but not everybody is going to get the lifeboat to the same degree, because once everybody figures out that this is a crowded movie theater with one exit door, that that not everyone gets the the benefit of it. Um, they will ultimately benefit over time because they they have a form of money, but they're not going to be able to have their wealth preserved through this horizon. I would say, because they own some shitty stock or bond right. um, or some illiquid asset, and all they really re- should have had was a, a better form of money, right. which is what Bitcoin presents. So I think mm-hmm. like people often say, like, is the U.S. government going to ban Bitcoin? It's like they're not going to willingly adopt Bitcoin. They're going to have to adopt Bitcoin if they want to function as a government. Mm-hmm. Like even governments need money to coordinate economic activity. It's no, it's, right. it's no different. Right. Um, so yes, the U S government and, and governments that adopt Bitcoin earlier are going to do better than, than governments that adopt Bitcoin later. 
We're gonna take a quick break from the show to hear from these sponsors. First up, Bitcoin 2023. That's right, plans are already underway for the biggest Bitcoin conference in the world. It's gonna be held in Miami next year, next May, and you can get your ticket with 10% off using the code HODL, H-O-D-L. This is gonna be an incredible event. It grows in size and scale every single year. Take a look at this video from last year where you can see amazing speakers like Michael Saylor, Jack Maulers, Kathy Wood. I was so grateful I got to anchor Bitcoin Magazine's live desk at Bitcoin 2022 and hear from some of the most brilliant minds in the space. You can network with companies, other Bitcoiners from around the world, and the parties and events going on in Miami Beach are pretty amazing as well. And if you don't wanna wait until May, I understand. How about Bitcoin Amsterdam? That's gonna be held this October. It's gonna be the first big Bitcoin conference in Europe, and you can get your ticket at b.tc slash conference for either Bitcoin Amsterdam or Bitcoin Miami 2023. Again, use the code HODL, H-O-D-L, for 10% off your pass. This episode is also brought to you by Fold. How would you like to earn Bitcoin on every single purchase and spin a fun wheel so that you can earn sats every single day? Fold is the best Bitcoin rewards debit card and shopping app in the world. Whether you're shopping at Amazon or grocery store or anywhere that you go, you can earn Bitcoin on every single thing you buy with Fold's Bitcoin cashback debit card. And you can spin the daily wheel, which is super fun to earn more free Bitcoin. And people have actually walked away with one whole coin on this. This thing. Head to foldapp.com slash Natalie and get 5,000 sats when you sign up. Now back to the show. And governments that adopt Bitcoin earlier are going to do better than, than governments that adopt Bitcoin later. So will, will that mean that El Salvador looks like, you know, futuristic land with like flying cars because they have all this Bitcoin and no one else does? I, I, don't, uh, I don't know if future cars is like the, you know, if in a Everyone has their own version of like what a better world looks like, but I hope there aren't the flying cars. <laughs> um, but um, I think that, you know, like one example is Venezuela, right? Mm-hmm. Venezuela used to be one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Their con- their currency was destroyed and wealth was destroyed. Mm-hmm. And so there is this idea, like everyone always, not everyone, but m- most people are inclined to believe that we only advance. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when money's destroyed, wealth is destroyed because your ability to coordinate economic activity becomes not just impaired, but um, not possible. Mm-hmm. And so you take a country like Venezuela that used to be one of the wealthiest countries in the world that has the lar- largest, if not largest, second largest oil right. deposits, reserves in the world, right. and they don't have a form of money to be able to coordinate the economic activity to get that oil out of the ground. Mm -hmm. And now they can't get reliable power to their city centers. I use that example to say whoever has the best form of money Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you can't screw it up, but you're going to odds on have the best chance of having economic coordination in a way that, uh, that is reliable and sends accurate price signals. In the case of Venezuela, Venezuela as a country owns Bitcoin. What will be more consequential is if the people Mm -hmm. in Venezuela in high densities adopt it early. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that remains to be seen. But I do think that wherever hard money is adopted or money that can't be printed is adopted, that, that those places, jurisdictions will have the most effective way to Mm -hmm. to build things to 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 trade to um expand the ability to have division of labor yeah to prosper to prosper um having studied the debt crisis so closely what do you think is going to happen as this all plays out right now with the fed trying to hike rates and fight inflation (laughs) another cpi print came out really high recently and you know i think that they're stuck between a rock and a hard place they're trying to prevent uh, a you know a, a serious recession or potentially even a deflationary bust at the same time you know if they start printing again we're going to get double digit cpi inflation it's already double digit you know yeah. unofficially do you <laughs> remember like, when uh it was like last fourth of july when like the biden administration put out a tweet that was like um fourth of july you know, like it was like 16 cents of deflation mm-hmm. like they tried to claim that like you know a fourth of july lunch yeah, was, yes, yes. Was cheaper, but it was like that always stuck in my head of like 16 cents of deflation. I'm like, give us a break. Like CPI, 8%, uh, you know, 
real estate and oil and gas yeah. is 40% higher. Yeah. Food's 40% higher. Those are the things yep. that we consume in our daily lives. So fuck off that, you know, yeah. CPI, <laughs> you know, like, um, so I think, so what, what happens? Yeah. What's going to happen? The fed is, it, it's going to, it's going to be identical to 2020, um, which or 2019 really. The Fed is trying to, quote, raise interest rates, uh, a system that has more debt can't bear higher interest rates, and that's the only way that their system works. They're going to start to try to take dollars out of the system. They may have already started in the last week. That was signaled. They might have gotten some better sense, but generally the Fed does not learn from its mistakes. It repeats them. Um, that's, a, that's a cardinal rule. But um, that they will do what they did in 2019. They... They will try to raise rates. They will, they will try to take the dollars that they put in, the newest round of dollars in in twenty twenty to today of about five trillion more, uh, what they inserted in the last two years, and um, and they will walk into a buzzsaw, just like they did in in September of twenty nineteen. That then was exacerbated in March of twenty twenty, and they will have to print more money than they've ever had to print before. Um, in that is the case because I think about it as when they start taking the dollars out, the entire world figures out just how many dollars they're short. Uh, and that doesn't mean that everyone is short dollars. And I mean, everybody's in debt, but the system as a whole is insolvent. Um, and so, so it will follow, ver follow a very similar pattern. It, the same thing won't break. But they will they will raise rates and they will take dollars out of the system until a time in which uh, the credit markets break, and that credit market breaking it basically causes the credit market to go into free fall, and the only way to prevent the free fall is to print trillions of dollars. Um, and if you're exposed to dollars, then you're you know like we're all going to have to suffer the consequences of of some sort of economic instability. Right. You have the form of money that can't be printed. Your purchasing power is going to, to hold better than anything else, mm -hmm. and that's going to allow you to buy things and source resources that you need to um, right. to live a decent life. So everyone that I've been talking to has said something. They're going to do this until something in the system breaks. You just you know said the same thing, and as that starts to unwind, they're going to come in, unprecedented money printing. I agree completely with your thesis. But in that sort of break, how far i mean bitcoin will will suffer because unfortunately it has been correlated with equities and with the stock market so don't you think bitcoin is vulnerable to potentially fall pretty low in that scenario before the printing recommences and injects more liquidity I, i'd say conventional wisdom says yes but uh, these aren't conventional times <laughs> so um i think that the the beautiful thing about bitcoin is that it eliminates imbalance as soon as it exists um, and that that exists because there were not only were there only ever be 21 million Bitcoin, but that you can't manipulate the supply mm -hmm. such that if people rush into Bitcoin too fast, someone will sell it on the other side and, you know, people buy Bitcoin irrationally, they sell Bitcoin irrationally. Mm -hmm. Those who find the signal tolerate all kinds of volatility and, you know, end up on the other side. Um, with a few scars, but unscathed. And so I think that, you know, since last year, there have been, there's been three or four different individual washouts and we've stayed right about where it is. Um, and I just think about those washouts as like the, the, the herd being cold, somewhere between the herd being cold and like violently shaking the tree and all the weak hands fall out. Right. So, in theory, anytime there's a rush on liquidity, um, which is what a credit crisis is, mm -hmm. everything that can be sold gets sold. Yep. And Bitcoin is liquid. Mm -hmm. It's like people don't rush and sell their real estate because it's illiquid. They sell <laughs> their liquid assets. So I think that is the conventional wisdom that says at the time of the next dollar liquidity crisis, which is probably within the next few months, <laughs> yeah. uh, that there could be turbulent times ahead for Bitcoin. But at the same time that inflation's going crazy and at the same time that Bitcoin has had three washouts and continued to hold this level, 
maybe this time isn't the same. But mm-hmm. that is what happened in March of 2020. Mm-hmm. That when the, right. the dollar system uh, collapsed. And because you have to remember. Right. The, uh, the dollar system is probably something like 150 trillion of financial assets. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, the credit system is 88. The stock, I think, is like 50. Maybe it's 60 now that the Fed's printed so much money. So it's something like 150 trillion to 200. Um, the global financial assets are 400 ish mm-hmm. trillion. Bitcoin, 600 billion, right? So a 1% move in broad financial markets is mm-hmm. like 4 trillion of paper wealth evaporating, right? Right. 8x what Bitcoin is today. Yeah. So yeah. it's still, while, it's, while it is significant as an individual asset and it's providing something significant for yeah. everyone that's storing wealth in it, if $4 trillion of wealth gets evaporated in terms of paper, that, that's, people, that's people running on dollars, right. trying to source the dollars that don't exist to pay the debts that they can't afford. Um, now imagine that credit market goes down 20%, right? Eighty trillion of paper assets just disappeared. Again, everything gets sold. In the gr- Great Financial Crisis, gold, this flight to safety, went down thirty percent versus the dollar. Mm-hmm. And the reason is that when there's a run on dollars and the dollar system is insolvent, the dollars actually strengthen for a period yes. of time, and then they print a bunch of money. And even if they didn't, yeah. if they just let the credit system collapse, yeah. the same thing would happen. The dollar would hyperinflate. Right. Um, and so it's like, I focus on in any path, it doesn't matter what happens in a month or two months or three months, survive for all weathers. Right. The only way to survive for all weathers is to have a form of money that works. Mm -hmm. And in my view, a form of money that works is one that cannot be printed by people in some far off land, Mm -hmm. um, by clicking a button on a computer screen. Well, I really look forward to the day that it's uncorrelated entirely, right? And we just have Bitcoin well, see, sailing that's the, that, off into that's the, the thing. Sunset. It's uncorrelated over time, <laughs> yeah. right? So even over 2020, right? Like yeah. Bitcoin crashed by 50% mm-hmm. and it became uncorrelated. Yeah. On a day-to-day basis, it appears to be correlated because people can't forecast sure. when does Michael Saylor come into the market and sure. buy a billion yeah. dollars worth of Bitcoin. Uh, and you can't forecast when the next thing happens. Yeah. And, and so so. It will, it is uncorrelated mm-hmm. and it will continue to be uncorrelated. It's just that, that when you, if you don't zoom out, you can't see it. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. Cause you know, again, I hate to use the dollar as a unit of account, but yeah. um, it still is. So um, like, you know, when Bitcoin's gone up three X mm-hmm. ver- or the dollars lost virtually 66% of its purchasing power relative to Bitcoin mm-hmm. said another way the stock market's only up like 20%. True. So is it correlated or is it just kind of after an adoption wave while it's doing price discovery, does it trade in a more correlated way, but as an underlying asset, because what it functionally is, it is every other asset in the dollar system is geared to make more dollars. Stock is only valuable because the company earns dollars. Right. Bond is only valuable because it says you have to pay me X number of dollars and interest. There's something fundamentally different from between a financial asset and the dollar. Mm-hmm. And there's a reason why all financial assets in the dollar system and the dollar are correlated. And it is because of this leverage. Mm-hmm. Bitcoin is competing with the dollar. Yeah. That is not true of financial assets. Financial assets make dollars and that derives their value and they are inherently correlated because their whole business models are designed to make more dollars. Bitcoin economy is an entirely different monetary system. Right. And so the reason at a fundamental level why, why Bitcoin is uncorrelated is because it is actually competing with the dollar. Facebook is not competing with the dollar. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, a bond of a corporation is not competing with the dollar. Mm-hmm. They are correlated because the only ability for those bonds to be repaid is if the Fed prints more money. Bitcoin, entirely different system. Well, politicians don't like that narrative of Bitcoin competing with the dollar. So how do you see it? Like, how do you see the two playing out? Because even when you listen to people like Saylor coming out there, he says that both it'll coexist and other currencies will collapse into the dollar and we'll have this sort of digital dollar and we'll have different rails, but Bitcoin will be the store of value and then also lightning. Like, how do you see it all playing out? (laughs) 
I think those are uh, th- those are gymnastics, <laughs> right? Um, I've actually talked to a few politicians that uh, I'd say understand that Bitcoin is competing with the dollar, and that also understand that um, there's nothing more American than Bitcoin. And so, um, don't don't uh, don't necessarily have a problem with the idea of competition if what it means is a lifeboat for something. Mm-hmm. Um, or a solution to something that's fundamentally broken. So I think that when people talk about it as uh, digital property, I, I think that I think you know someone like say I just I won't be passive aggressive. I think that uh, I think that he actually knows, and I think that uh, so I think I think that he understands, and that he understands also that that's not very palatable to the national mm-hmm. security state, um, mm-hmm. and he runs a public company and he's got a big X on his back and that he's being judicious. Got it. Uh, and, and that, that is perfectly understandable. Um, so <laughs> I just, I think that, um, anybody, you know, he had a comment. So if you come to understand Bitcoin, there's no way that you only have 1%. He came to understand Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. So I don't think that he doesn't understand this. Got it. I actually really like your answer. So I respect it. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about custody and lending. Um, I personally think that the idea of becoming your own bank, individual sovereignty, taking self custody, I think it's a beautiful um, mission. And I and I personally take self custody and I have cold storage. But I also think it hinders a little bit of adoption because there are some folks out there that I don't think will ever want to take that responsibility. I whether they're older generations that maybe aren't as comfortable with technology or I don't know. I mean, I think people can relate. Like, haven't you ever had that moment where you're transferring to like your cold storage and you're like checking things? Like, what if something got deleted? Did I copy it right? Did something refresh? It's just a nerve wracking feeling. And I think that people will want to trust a custodian. So can you just talk a little bit about, you know, your thoughts on self custody and I guess how the multi sig plays into this? Because that sort of that sort of is a solution, right? Yeah. But but first, like, don't you feel alive in that moment too? I though? do, I do. Right? You're like, I did I send it to the right place, or did <laughs> I've I had just some send? Scares, yeah, so. <laughs> uh, it's like you really got to feel alive. You want to yeah. send a Bitcoin transaction, and see if it gets to where you're going to. <laughs> um, no, so I think that look, kind of transitioning from our that last point. Most people do not want to think about the um, what's how this is going to play out. What Mm -hmm. are the consequences of destroying our money? But just because somebody doesn't want to think about the discomfort of, of playing that out to his logical conclusion doesn't mean that it's happening one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And that my experience with people in Bitcoin, in order for people to see Bitcoin, they have to want to know. Mm -hmm. Not everybody wants to know. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Some people don't want to go down the rabbit hole whether it's because they don't think that they're going to come out the other side and understand it, or because maybe there's some real consequences if the dollar goes away, and that's a scary world too. Um, I, I I don't think it's a scary world, but uh, my point is that the same is true of self custody. Not everybody wants to know. Um, like not everyone wants to know the importance, but that isn't something that's specific to self custody. Yeah. It's something that's specific to, to Bitcoin. Yeah. It's like it's something that is hard, seems complicated, and but there's a reason why the longer that somebody has Bitcoin, uh, the far more likely they are to hold their own keys. So mm-hmm. the people that Agreed. operate in the world of Bitcoin that possess the most knowledge do this thing. Mm-hmm. And it is because of trial and error and past history and tears, mm-hmm. you know, things that have ended poorly, Mt. Gox, that like sure. the way that Bitcoin works, and this is part of my own education to Bitcoin, it was things like Mt. Gox caused people to invest in self-custody. People got burned and in Bitcoin, it eliminates moral hazard. Mm -hmm. The dollar system is moral hazard. Yes. And when Mt. Gox got hacked, it wasn't like 600,000 Bitcoin just got redistributed. It was, you lost your Bitcoin, do better next time. Yeah, consequences. Yeah. We don't have consequences. Extreme ownership. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But what that caused was people to start developing hardware wallets or accelerate the development of hardware, more hardware wallets showing up. Um, The next iteration of that, a lot of what we do is multi-sig. So Mm -hmm. the point is that that, um, it it, it isn't hard, Mm -hmm. but it's also 
something that requires intentionality. I agree. Okay. And in a world where people have very low attention spans, Mm -hmm. my friend, like Will, the way he described it at, at, I think, Bitcoin 2022 was holding your own keys isn't harder than driving a car. Right. But if you don't know how to drive a car and you get behind the wheel, you can do some damage to yourself. Completely. Right. And that, I love that's, that. that's, that's, analogy, I think the right yeah. analogy. Great. That it's not harder than driving a car. You just got to know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of what we do as a company. We have a concierge onboarding service where we help walk people through that. Mm-hmm. But the idea of with great power comes great responsibility. If you want to have unilateral access to your money Mm -hmm. in a way that no man, woman, bureaucrat, nobody can prevent you from uh, accessing like your entire life savings. Mm -hmm. There is no way to do that as easily as signing up for a Venmo account or signing up for a PayPal account. Yeah. That like it is becoming easier and easier Mm -hmm. and more and more secure but there is no getting around that if you want the benefit of unilateral access to your wealth, elimination of counterparty risk, mm-hmm. you want that power, yeah. which is great, it comes with responsibility. Yeah. And and that responsibility comes with combination of intention mm-hmm. intentionality and willingness to bear the responsibility. Right. And so, um, but everybody, not to a person everybody, but the vast majority of people the the function of time that experience Bitcoin, they end there. They start out and say, I don't know if I can do that. And then they ultimately end up there because there is no perfect solution. Mm -hmm. And what most find, the overwhelming most, is that they would rather take on the responsibility, be in control of their own destiny. For sure. Uh, It's not an ideological, in my view, it's not an ideological principle. It is actually a security principle. Right. It uh, it massively reduces your attack surface. Yep. And that the way that you solve for the the risks is through redundancy. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. And that that in many ways, in my view, is where we come in and where multisig comes in. Yeah, and I, I wanted to ask about that, but surely this year has placed a spotlight on on all of this because you don't want your assets confiscated potentially, and you can't always trust third parties that may or may not, you know, have influence from p- the political sphere like we saw in Canada. Um, so it really it really makes self custody, I think, more and more important. But for those out there that might be listening or watching this that really don't understand what multi sig is, what's like the simplest way you can describe it? Well, bef- first, before I go there, like mm-hmm. the, the, the Canada thing, like there have been a few events that have been formative. Huge. Canada, people's life savings got zapped because mm-hmm. they donated $50 to truckers. Because they shared their with, opinion, with, the wrong opinion. With no due yeah. process. Yeah. Right? right. And And that is something that is possible due to centralization. Yep. It's possible in the U.S. financial system. It's possible in the Canadian financial system. But then the U.S. government froze, or the Fed, the U.S. government froze $600 billion of Russia's financial assets. Every single form of money that exists today, gold, fiat currencies, mm-hmm. everything is dependent on trust. Bitcoin is the only one that is not dependent on trust. But you have to hold your own keys if you do not want your money, which represents your life savings, to potentially be stripped from you at the click of a button. Mm -hmm. That is the only way. Bitcoin and holding your own keys. Same thing, though, in May, Coinbase came out with their disclosure that basically said, Mm -hmm. in the case of a bankruptcy, your assets may be treated as our general unsecured liabilities. That is counterparty risk. And, like, we have not seen greater activity. I mean, like, the activity that immediately came after, it's like people responded to the Canada piece people responded to russia people have responded to the coinbase mm-hmm. piece more so than almost any of those that because right. it hit close to home a lot of people still have bitcoin on coinbase and they're like okay but that is the market finding signals so um when i think about kind of the the multi-sig piece mm-hmm. it's like people over time if they're paying attention to bitcoin they find the signal i need to take custody i need to take on this responsibility yes. and once you start to understand bitcoin too you're like okay why would i am i not you know, big enough for this task. Yeah. Of course I am. Um, and they, they get more confidence because they've figured out the world's greatest secret. Um, mm-hmm. and, and then they know more, so they're able to more confidently do that. But if you're going to take self-custody of your assets, when I think about Canada or Coinbase 
and all the, the, you know, some hopeless Bitcoiners that or not Bitcoiners, but people that have their Bitcoin there uh, or what happened, you know, in the global financial system with Russia. All of those three things are only possible because of centralization. Mm -hmm. And what centralization ultimately means is that there is a single point of failure. Yes. So when you're taking control of your own keys. You're also a single point and, of and failure, and right? If you, and, if you're, <laughs> and if you're putting them on one key, mm -hmm. which you can, that is a single point of failure yeah. itself. The principle underlying, I think, the best security principle in Bitcoin is eliminate single points of failure. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so in the context of self-custody, my view is that the best way to achieve that is through multi-sig. And what multi-sig, it's important to recognize that if there's 19 million Bitcoin that are in circulation and there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin and that Bitcoin is finitely scarce, precious asset, got to hold on to it well, that you cannot put yourself in a position to lose that. And that in the idea of eliminating single points of failure with 19 million in circulation, you have to you have to understand that all Bitcoin, all 19 million Bitcoin are controlled by keys, mm -hmm. okay? And that Bitcoin can either be controlled by a single key or Bitcoin can be controlled by multiple keys at the same time. So you could control one Bitcoin with one key or you could control one Bitcoin with two keys or you control one Bitcoin with two of three keys. You could also have a thousand Bitcoin on one key or a thousand Bitcoin mm -hmm. controlled by two keys or a thousand Bitcoin controlled by two of three keys. The point is okay. all Bitcoin are controlled by keys. Yep. And if you're eliminating single points of failure, there's this property in Bitcoin that's native to Bitcoin called multi-sig. Mm -hmm. It is what it sounds like, uh, that there are multiple keys and multiple signatures that are required to move any Bitcoin. So that if you ever lose, say in a system, which is ours, there's three keys and two of them are required to, to move Bitcoin. Wow. That if you ever lose one, one, your Bitcoin are not at risk of loss. If some malicious actor stole one key, they couldn't move any Bitcoin. Or if uh, you got in a boating accident, you're not totally screwed. You have to get in two boating accidents uh, in order to, to potentially not be able to move your Bitcoin. But this, this idea of you've got multiple keys, you can have thresholds, and it becomes highly fault tolerant such that you can make uh, not just one mistake, but potentially two mistakes or potentially three mistakes and still move your, your Bitcoin or still have access to your Bitcoin. So that idea, like the principle is eliminate single points of failure. Multi-sig is a solution because it eliminates mm -hmm. single points of failure, but it also is highly fault tolerant. You're able to make mistakes and still uh, have access to all, all of your money. I love that. That was a great explanation, by the way. So thank you. I think that's really helpful. I'm working. I need to do my multi-sig. And I think it's going to just grow, grow and grow as yeah. adoption grows. So it's really cool. Um, last thing I want to talk to you about is lending. This is something that also I think is going to grow. More people are going to use Bitcoin as collateral. I think there are, you know, one of the things that's been saddest for me to see as a millennial is just so many of my peers saying, I can't afford a house, especially in the big, you know, cities. You can't afford a place in LA very easily with the standard job that you would get out of college, even 10 years after college. And I think Bitcoin is sort of a, a representation of hope for millennials and younger generations to become homeowners and to 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 build generational wealth so how like can you kind of explain how that works let's say someone wants to take out a loan against their bitcoin to buy a house what are the risks of that how does that work you know because yeah. bitcoin's volatile it could drop very, it very is quickly. yeah so one um the the reason that you would take a, a bitcoin back loan is so that you didn't have to sell bitcoin um, but you, you need to do that very conservatively, uh, because the way a Bitcoin back loan works is you, you need, um, you want a $10,000 loan cause you don't want to sell $10,000 worth of Bitcoin. You have to post in our system, you have to post $25,000 worth of Bitcoin as collateral. Um, uh, but that if it goes down to a certain threshold that, and you don't post additional collateral, then we get in a situation where we send a, a notice that says you either need to post additional collateral or we'll have to sell a portion of your Bitcoin. Wow. The point is that... You could get washed out. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that is why people, if they are going to 
take a loan one they need to understand it um and we create all the resources to help people understand that but there's also a reason when i go out and explain bitcoin i i really don't sell our our loans i you know we have all the resources to understand them but we're not a loan pusher you know um because a lot of our clients have held on to their bitcoin because they took loans but there have been instances where clients in March 2020, as an example, got liquidated. Yeah. Um, and so the point is you have to know the risk and that you have to protect against that by being very conservative. I, d I don't know what the number is, but I would say, like, don't borrow against more than 10% of your Bitcoin or 20% of it. your Bitcoin, such that if Bitcoin comes down that you have more Bitcoin to post mm -hmm. um, and that you're not putting the majority uh, or anywhere close to that at risk um, because the, you know, our loan is not a value to people if it doesn't allow them to have more Bitcoin in right. the end than less. And if they're not conservative in terms of the amount of, of Bitcoin that they're going to borrow against, then they could potentially be in a scenario where they can't, um, if the price comes down, provide Right. more bitcoin is collateral to get it back in that position so so what are your thoughts on people taking fiat loans to buy bitcoin um, maybe your thoughts are different right now in this macro environment well, but what I, if someone again, took out a 100k loan today to buy bitcoin <laughs> people have done that yeah they have. um that i i think again it just needs to be conservative okay right so if a hundred thousand dollars is only 10 percent of your bitcoin holdings you know yeah. I, again maybe it's 20 percent mm -hmm. but um that it should, it should in whether whatever you're buying a home bitcoin mm -hmm. whatever the the dynamic doesn't change don't yeah. put uh more than a certain percentage of your bitcoin at risk and that that will be what ensures that you have that bitcoin and more yeah well as we start to wrap up um just any takeaways i think a lot of people right now are just a little nervous because everything's volatile stocks have dropped bitcoin's dropped um, they're still trying to hike rates, inflation's flying. Like, what is going to, I mean, the scenario that could possibly happen in a in a crash where they need to print money, it's kind of scary. So, I don't know, what are some takeaways or final thoughts? Um, so, in my journey to Bitcoin, I first came to the conclusion that they were going to have to print trillions more dollars and that that system was going to collapse. You know, I wasn't like, I didn't be immediately become a prepper. I didn't become, you know, super dystopian. But I was like, holy shit, that's some rough, uh, what's going to happen? Um, and, but it, but it is very like, um, created a sense of pessimism. Like the future is not going to be better than the past because of this reason. Mm -hmm. And then I figured out Bitcoin, you know? And so I just think that people, they need to like, if they're worried they need to go deeper down the Bitcoin rabbit hole because like Bitcoin is the solution. So it's like, it doesn't matter how much pain is going to be felt is that the solution is actually here. And that solution is what ensures that patient doesn't die on the table mm -hmm. and that the other side of the economic turbulence instability, however you want to describe it will be better than mm -hmm. where we're currently at. Um, and so that, I view Bitcoin as a, a great source of optimism and it's not just because like, you know, put your hope in like making money. It's that go out to this hackathon and you see all these people building. They don't talk about the price of Bitcoin. No. They talk about building. And so when people, yeah. and I always talk about this at the Houston Bitcoin meetup or the Austin Bitcoin meetup, that no one talks about price. And that what most of the world sees is something that they think is a financial asset that's trading on a screen and what's actually happening is that people are building a new monetary system. Mm -hmm. And that monetary system is built on payment rails like the Lightning Network. Two nights ago, the Lightning Developers Meetup mm -hmm. was packed wall to wall here. Mm -hmm. Adam Back was here. Um, last two days, hackathon. It's like these people are building yeah. and it is the lifeboat. So it's like, yeah, there's going to be some shit. But if you figured out Bitcoin, if you figured out that there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin, not what that means to you as like, I'm going to make a bunch of money. You're like, the world has good money. Yeah. The world having good money leads to trade, specialization, division of labor. We are going to have to course correct from the insanity that, that has been 
central bankers and governments printing trillions of dollars running on sustainable deficits to a more sane world, but Bitcoin is what brings us back to that. So, um, but if you don't understand Bitcoin or the why, pick up the Bitcoin standard. Um, I wrote a series called Gradually Then Suddenly. So all the resources are out there um, and that, that will be the source of optimism that says, yeah, whatever happens, we'll, we'll be stronger on the other side, but you just have to have a little bit of confidence. Yeah, totally. I love your series. Bitcoin gave me hope for the future because I was totally jaded about it being a reporter. Um, Parker, thank you. And this feels like a very full circle moment because about a year ago, I was begging to come to your party at Unchained at the Bitcoin conference. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I at least in my, in my, I mean, I feel like if we're going to go there, I got to at least like wrap up. I, oh yeah. Most people don't know the story, but if you want to touch on it, I, I didn't get it. I didn't, I got turned away twice by Parker at the first Bitcoin conference for the Unchained party, but I get it. I was just there with my best friend. No one knew. Um, yeah, I didn't know Natalie. She showed Nobody up. Nobody did. And I, I was like, Bitcoin. I was like, I'm sorry. I can't let you in. And she was like, what? I'm like, I'm sorry. I can't let you in. Uh, but she came to the. I waited uh, a year. She waited a year, and uh, and we had a great time. Same place. Great. It was that awesome. was partly that was full circle. And it was this proof is, of work. This is even more full circle. It was here. Pr- it was proof of work. I appreciated it. It was. Yeah. It's a great memory now because me and my best friend we were like, but there's, it's, you know, it's mostly guys in there. Don't you have <laughs> room for like two? No. Okay. All right. Maybe next year. <laughs> um, you know, I'm a man of principles. <laughs> you uh, are. But I respect we'll, we'll always, you for we, it. We will always share that. I respect you know, We will you always for be it. bonded for that. Yeah, I love it. It well, was proof of work. It was. It was proof. And of then work. next year, this past year, we a had a great party. time. It was my favorite party yeah. at Bitcoin Miami. So it always is. All right. Well, Parker, thank you. It's great. All right. Thank you, Natalie.